Hello and welcome to Media 7, where we're joined by a live audience at Auckland's Classic Comedy Club. In this week's show, we'll look again at the news media's trouble with numbers, remember Len Lai and go to the races. But our major topic is broadcasting and the government's broadcasting policy. In a week when TVNZ announced it would be shedding 90 jobs, including those of senior journalists. We'll be joined by the Minister of Broadcasting, Jonathan Coleman, and then a panel of commentators. But first, let's loosen up with the news mash. Well, if there was a news war between a financial channel and a comedy channel, and the comedy channel won. I can't reconcile the brilliance and knowledge that you have of the intricacies of the market with the crazy bull I see you do every night. We're fair game. We're big network. We've been out front and we've made mistakes. We've got 17 hours of live TV to, a day to do. But uh, I certainly... Maybe, maybe you could cut down on that. <laughs> Meanwhile, economic bombs rain down on the British and jobs burn up on a bonfire of bad loans. Do they look bothered? So, I'm going to put all your details into the computer and it's going to tell us whether you're going to keep your job or not. Computer says no. <laughs> well, a bit probably, but the spirit of the Blitz was present when the biennial TV fundraiser Comic Relief hauled in around £60 million. Give some money. Was it because Lenny Henry touched a nation's heart? I want to thank everybody that's ever helped us, ever. And I want to say again, could you do it tonight, one more time? It'd be really great if you did. Or because Doctor Who finally had sex. Elsewhere in the world, it was format TV season, whatever the weather. I've just never seen such terrible walking in my life. TV3's punt on the local Next Top Model show paid off in the ratings. But auditions for America's Next Top Model went haywire as thousands of thin girls in heels tried to run away after a car overheated and somebody thought it was a terror attack. You will hear that squealing when the world ends. Meanwhile in Australia, former Dancing with the Stars competitor Pauline Hanson has had her latest political campaign interrupted by the publication in two Murdoch papers of what are said to be 30-year-old nude pictures of her. That is not me in those photos. Or not. This is not the first upset on Hanson's short campaign trail. There was this on day one. The bloody media. Before I tell you We know what you're thinking, it's just like a reality show. But wait, there's more. Hanson's opponent in the seat of Beau Desert, that's French sort of, is Aidan McClendon who was once charged and fined for storming the stage during the final of Australian Big Brother. So, will they vote her off the island? That was your public good news mash. We're joined now by the Minister of Broadcasting, Jonathan Coleman. Welcome back, Minister. Thanks, Russell. You're the only MP we've had on this show. Oh, that's and an honour. Again. Um, one, one thing that, that, that I've thought about, you've been interviewed a lot sure. uh, in, in the past couple yep. of weeks. For better or worse, your Labour predecessors always had a clear philosophy about broadcasting yep. and public broadcasting in particular. Yep. I'm not clear on what yours is. Can you clear that up for me? Well, basically, my philosophy on public broadcasting is that it has to reflect uh, the society uh, that funds it. So in this case, you know, it has to reflect New Zealand society and it has to achieve uh, certain aims. Um, but the debate really is around the mechanism of doing that. And my philosophy is that competitive allocation of funds to support public broadcasting rather than the direct support of uh, public broadcasters is the way to go. But wh why is it there? Why are we paying for it? Why are we paying for it? Well, New Zealanders like to see their lives, uh, their world reflected on the screen. So uh, it does have a role in uh, reflecting our lifestyle and our culture. But I don't think necessarily, uh, well, I fundamentally believe public broadcasting doesn't, it doesn't have to be shown by a public broadcaster per se, because if you look at the way people are watching television and the way the world's going, people are watching uh, content across a whole range of platforms. People are going to be selecting their content very much along the lines of the iPod model. And so aggregating what are actually limited funds 
just in one space is not going to make sense in the future. So I think the debate has to be forward looking rather than looking into the past and trying to run the debate about models which are being rapidly superseded. You're still not inspiring me, I'm afraid. No, um, the, too bad. Well, the, you, you mentioned the, the idea of culture, which is something yep. you've been somewhat dismissive about in the past. In, in the House, well, been in, the house culture, I think in 2007, you, you, you called Steve Mahari the MP for Palmerston North Korea because he talked about national identity. But surely that is supporting yeah. and fostering national identity is one of the roles of public broadcasting. Well, I would say to you that uh, New Zealanders don't need to be told what their national identity is. New Zealanders can decide that for themselves. And in terms of the media, there's a whole range of uh, content, both publicly and privately funded, that goes towards shaping our, na our national identity. Now, for better or worse, uh, people can see their national identity reflected in the private uh, broadcasters as well as the public. So you could argue that talkback radio goes towards shaping national identity. It's not all necessary, uh, necessarily about watching um, higher end uh, broadcasting on publicly funded television. So, it's, well, it's, I, national identity yeah. is shaped by a range of experiences that people are exposed to and that reflects the world that they exist in. So the, the, the shade of meaning here is that you're, you, you see public broadcasting reflecting our identity rather than at, perhaps as Labor did in fostering it. Would that be accurate? Well, I mean, it's hard to decide, to state where one ends and the other begins. I mean, it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. But um, the the quip about North Korea, you've got to understand the context, as you do understand, in which these parliamentary things happen. But um, if you want to look at countries where and the Michael national was quite rude about you in return. Oh, I'm sure say, he was. Yes. Uh, but where the national broadcaster dictates. Uh, the uh, national identity. I mean, that tends to be more, you know, in totalitarian regimes. Now, of course, there's a spectrum and there's a middle ground. But the point I was making is I don't think you can be thoroughly prescriptive about these things. New Zealanders will choose what their identity is and they, they don't need the government to tell them that. That was a big theme for the last government. Uh, we have a different approach because we're not the same government, we don't have the same philosophies. Now, you were asked a question on Morning Report this week sure. about whether you saw a role for a public broadcaster and you, you rather dodged it and talked about public broadcasting. Yeah. Can, can, can we have another go at that question now? Is there a role for a public broadcaster? I know you've said you're not going to sell TVNZ yep, in sure. this term. Well, look, the fact of the matter is we don't have the funding for one public broadcaster in terms of television. I mean, you know, the funding is very fragmented. If you And it comes back to this argument of how people are going to source their content into the future. And they're going to source it across a whole range of uh, platforms. I think what you're driving at is should uh, the government still continue to own television New Zealand? Well, look, uh, my personal philosophy is that uh, I'm quite comfortable with the government owning TVNZ because I think uh, this is my view, it may not necessarily be the view of all my colleagues, but um, you do want to have a certain amount of uh, control over what you can put out. So, you know, while that might uh, sound uh, you know, not necessarily absolutely compatible with some of the stuff we've just talked about. At the end of the day, no, we don't want to have a situation where all we have to watch is Fox News. And I wouldn't want to see that, and I don't think most New Zealanders would. So I'm comfortable with the government owning TVNZ, and frankly, the vast majority of New Zealanders are. And so that's where it's at. And, you know, we've been quite upfront about that. We have said we're not selling TVNZ. There's no debate within the party about selling it. Uh, we've got our position and we're sticking to it. Uh, now, you've carried through on your promise to yep. remove the TVNZ charter money from, from sure, TVNZ yep. and make it available on a, on a contestable basis yep. via the NZ on Air system. Yep. What I'm interested in is whether this will be tagged as charter style money or will it just go out as more NZ on Air money? No, uh, there are going to be some pretty rigid criteria around it. Um, so it's not just going to go into the general pool. Like, I want to see it. Uh, produce um, some quality stuff and of course one person's quality is another person's rubbish but it will be stated when the funds are launched what uh, will be the criteria for projects applying for that fund. So we want to be able to say look this is what this 15 million dollars has produced over this year these projects have this money specifically attached to it we don't want to be in a situation like the last government was where this money was 
injected into television New Zealand and then they spent uh, the last couple of terms having to justify where that money had gone. So we want to be quite transparent and uh, not everyone will agree with the funding allocation and the funding decisions, but that $15 million will go into quality public broadcasting. Now, TVNZ screened those charter programmes, the, one, the ones that were yeah. clearly, obviously, charter yep. programmes, because it was the public broadcaster. Sure. You are now going to be asking commercial broadcasters yep. to screen non-commercial programming, aren't you? Well, I don't think that uh, quality public broadcasting and uh, commerciality and general appeal are ne necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, I want this funding to produce programming that the majority of the population can look at and say that's quality public broadcasting. So it's not going to be niche, obscure stuff that frankly no one wants to watch. That may not please everybody. But the point about it is But niche, that obscure stuff is often important programming. It's, it, it's often serious programming that does what is not being done by the market. And well, if you look across the market now, we've got the most diversified and competitive uh, television market that we've ever had. So um, you couldn't say that there's not choice on our screens. Admittedly, you have to get pay TV to access some of that choice, but there is a great variety of content. There's more than e ever before. So you could say that the choice is there for people. Well, th this is interesting, the pay yep. TV question, because yeah, you, yeah. you said in another interview with, with, with Media yep. Watch that it wasn't the government's job to support ailing or failing mm. business models. Yep. Does, that, does that extend to, you know, say we see a situation where there is no substantial free-to-air television in New Zealand at all? It's not out of the question. Would you let that happen? Well, look, I don't think we're, A, in that situation. All media companies are having a tough time, and B, I don't think we're going to be in that situation. And when you look at this broadcasting review of regulation, which looked at these competition issues, uh, I've sought, I, I told the officials, look, I know you guys are recommending doing this review. Give us everything you've got at the moment. Let's look at it. And do you know what answer they've come back with? MED and MCH both tell me that there are no competition issues in New Zealand television currently. And I will be releasing that report, so it'll be completely trans... Uh, you know, and I have to say there are people in the industry who take quite a different view. There are, but I can tell you they do differ, because you know, I'm going to be upfront about this. MCH think there could be issues in the future. Well, MED let, don't. Let's pursue this for a couple yep. of minutes. Uh, would you like to see the channel we're on and TVNZ6, the two new digital yep. channels, available on the Sky platform? Yes, I would. Yep, I think are you hopeful be... that will happen? Uh, yes, I am. Yep, I think that could well happen because it's publicly funded content. And uh, you know, TVNZ, their philosophy is available on every screen. Uh, nearly 50% of New Zealanders do have Sky, and they want to have access to that content. So would I don't you, think you, exclusive. Would about you then, it. by the same token, mm. like to see Sky make Prime its free-to-air channel available on Freeview because that now contains quite a lot of publicly funded well, programming? I, I ideally would, but I'm not the shareholder in Sky. You know, so the it's government purely is the a commercial in decision TVNZ. for them. Now, we're talking about, with Freeview, yep. we're talking about 200,000 households. Hmm. I struggle to believe that that's not commercially viable. I have a rough idea yep. of what it would cost for them to get on Freeview. Would it be of concern to you if they were protecting their pay TV business by withholding Prime from Freeview? Look, the reality of it is we have competition law in New Zealand, and this has been examined by the Commerce Commission. Uh, they said it's OK. Um, so, you know, maybe the issue is if you're not happy with it, you need to look at the Commerce Commission. But, you know, under New Zealand law, it was found not to be anti-competitive. Sounds a bit like the 1990s when the Commerce Commission let, uh, let telecom run right, though. Well, I think things are quite different. I mean, you know, uh, there aren't the, uh, the barriers to access that there were in the telecommunications uh, industry. So I think you've got to look at the situation we're in now, where the future's going to be and what's going to be practical for the future. And the whole point of our broadcasting policy has been, look, let's be practical. Because let's face it, Labor had nine years, they couldn't make the charter work. We've got something we think that is practical, and we're going to deliver on it. Well, we'll see what our commentators Thanks. think. We'll take a break now, and after the break, we will be joined by a panel of commentators who I suspect will have plenty to say.